Um, I'm John Burgess, and on behalf of all my colleagues uh, from Mainstream Technologies, I want to welcome you to this uh, quarterly uh, Lunch and Learn. For those of you that uh, are, have been with us before, you know that we, we try to do this about every three months and try to, try to do a variety of topics and a variety of uh, types of presentations. And for you new people, then uh, we hope to see you again at, at one of our events later in the year. So um, while my panel comes up and gets, uh, gets ready, now, today, um, and every organization has technology embedded in it, right? So today's technological organization is under attack, you know, from literally everywhere in the world and across a broad spectrum of tactics. Um, it's just a fact, you know. It's here and it's not going away. What everybody has to understand in this kind of new world is that no one tool or policy is going to defend against everything. You have to have a, a variety of tools and a variety of approaches to effectively defend your organization from all these myriad attacks. And you know, therefore, if you, if you have, have to have this mix, it's, it's really easy to, to bite things that you don't need and underutilize things that you do need. So knowing the right assortment, knowing what each tool, what its purpose and role is for in your comprehensive strategy is, uh, is critical to having a, a cost-effective but, but also a fully enveloping uh, defense strategy. So uh, very uh, honored to have an all-star panel here with us today. Uh, from uh, here on stage, uh, stage left, your right, is uh, Greg McKee, who's the uh, Chief Information Officer of Friday Eldridge and Clark. Uh, Greg served as the CIO for, for the law firm for over 16 years. Uh, during the 21 preceding years, he held numerous positions at Euronet Worldwide, uh, where he developed software for ATM and EFT networks. While at Euronet, Greg satisfied uh, then current and all future desires for international travel. And I can, I can attest to that. Um, Greg uh, began his career as an industrial engineer, and while at Timex, became enamored with programming and uh, found a way to make the jump to IT. And he, uh, he's a holder of a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science degree. And uh, Greg and I have known each other for uh, a long time. Too long. <laughs> Where we, we worked together at, at, at a, a company called Arkansas Systems, which was the predecessor of Euronet uh, several years ago. So uh, please join me in welcoming Greg to our panel. On, the, uh, on my far right, your far left, is uh, Jason Lafayette, who's the uh, Director of Technology, Analytics, and Process Services for the Wilson Law Group in Little Rock. Um, there, Jason's responsible for overseeing the day-to-day -day technology operations of the firm, which include the desktop and network services groups, along with the business process analyst, applications, and development groups. And he's been with Wilson uh, since 2003. So uh, Jason's been a uh, participant in some of our presentations before, and we're glad to have him back. So welcome, Jason. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, in the center there, uh, Daniel Weatherly, who is uh, the Director of Security Services uh, for us at Mainstream. Um, Daniel's been with us for 15 years, a little over 15 years, mm -hmm. uh, where he's, he's held a variety of positions. He was uh, the Director of our Managed Services Practices for uh, many years. And a couple of years ago, when we, when we uh, stood up the uh, security services group, uh, Daniel transitioned over and is, and is uh, where he leads that group for us now. Um, he's been uh, a, he's a 20 plus year veteran of, of, the, of the industry. Yes. Uh, well traveled. And uh, as I was explaining earlier, he is our, uh, uh, for many years, he's been mainstream's uh, prairie dog or meerkat. He, he's the one that has his head up and, and notices what's happening off in the distance that we all need to be aware of. So uh, have a great panel, and I uh, hope uh, they're going to shed some uh, valuable insight on, uh, on what we're talking about today. So our, our panel kind of all agrees here that the, the foundation in any good you know, you know, cybersecurity strategy starts with a firewall. Um, and I guess you know, a firewall is designed to keep bad stuff out. It's to keep all the, the bad stuff on one side of the wall. So that's a, you know, if you're gonna, you're gonna start with the defense, you want a high wall, you want a, you want a thick wall around your organization. But I guess what we, uh, as we dive into firewalls then, wanted, wanted to ask the panel some questions as far as, you know, what, what makes a good firewall? Um, and what are some good firewall tips, uh, you know, as far as how you configure them, how you deploy them? Um, so I'll, uh, 
Who wants to take this first? Greg? I will because I'm going to be kind of a rebel on this question. Okay. John. Um, as we've gone through things, uh, it seems to come down to the, the person sitting in front of the computer that's the final firewall. And in, in terms of tools, um, you know, uh, I don't want to say firewall is a commodity, but in, in getting past the human nature of curiosity to click on this and that, um, one of the most important tools for us has become, uh, and I think we're talking about specific tools here, right? So <clears throat> we use a tool called Know Before to um, uh, pro propagate training, uh, phishing messages, and it's amazing to me how much attention this has garnered from the firm's management when um, you, know, you relate to a story of one of the world's largest law firms being taken down for weeks because of a click on a, uh, a malicious mm -hmm. attachment. So, you know, our last go round of testing, we had four people still that clicked and gave credentials and it's like, it only takes one, y'all. And you're, you know, there's four of you that did it. <laughs> so, um, you know, the firewall is important, but what we're trying to get across uh, with the results of these tests and counseling individually to these people is, you know, the kind of old rules. You don't, you don't click for curiosity. You, you gotta know the sender, you gotta know that it's, you were expecting it, it's necessary for your job. And uh, you don't want to be the one that brings the, uh, the firm to its knees for, you know, a, a, in a moment of distraction. Sure. So I'm going to let that be my firewall <laughs> contribution uh, as to the human firewall. Daniel, Jason? Sure. Well, I guess, we, I'm sorry, did we want to mention, John, you'd add, you said ahead of time, what, what do some of these tools cost? Well, this is probably, no before, it's probably one of the most effective for the cost price tools that we'll use. I think it comes out to 20, uh, comes out to $15 a user per year to educate them, test them, keeps track of the results, uh, what they did. You know, it's down to they, they opened it, they clicked on it, they, they entered credentials, you know, mm -hmm. very granular data, plus a, a warning, of course, when they do the wrong thing that comes up on the screen. So it's, uh, <clears throat> and uh, unlike things we would devise, you know, very realistic emails that look like they came from the IT team or look like they came from Visa or somebody like that. So about $15 per user per year, uh, a very, very cost-effective product. Cool. Sure. I would add that uh, human firewall, very important, last line of defense. But I'm going to talk about the initial firewall, the, the classic firewall that sits between your internet connection and your company network. And how should you configure it? Uh, I like to use the term default deny. Deny everything unless you need it for a specific business reason. A lot of firewalls I see are not configured that way. For example, a configuration will allow anyone on the network to surf the internet. Do servers have a reason to be surfing the internet? No, so why do you allow it? Deny it unless it's needed. So the best practice Turn off everything and open up just what's needed. So Greg was talking about clicks and why do those work? Because the machine reaches out to the internet to a known bad site and downloads malware. There are other layers we're gonna talk about, some that can be included within firewalls that can do geo-blocking, you know, block countries that are known for attacking. Uh, they can do scanning of the packets going back and forth to your browser and often stop malicious content from being downloaded. So these are often called next generation firewalls. Uh, firewalls typically within the last five years or so will have these type of additions in them where they can do a lot more than just block IP traffic. They can actually look at the traffic and see if it's malicious and block it. So have a next gen firewall and go with a default deny configuration would be my advice. And I'm gonna jump in the middle. So, <laughs> I'm in complete agreement with uh, what both these gentlemen said. Uh, the end user really dictates a lot of what's going to happen with your firewall. If you start a prevention campaign where, it's a little loud, but um, if you start a prevention campaign where your employees know where to go, where not to go on the internet, you're going to limit how much attacking is going to come towards you. You go to bad sites, you go to suspicious sites, they're like, hey, let's see what this person is looking at. Let's follow them back home and see how secure they are. So your behavior creates a pattern. It's not just your Google Analytics searches and you start 
I'm looking for a car. And then everywhere you go, you see car ads. The bad guys are doing this as well. They're tracking to see what you do, where you're, where you're going to, things like that. So if your end users are informed, if they behave in a certain way, that's gonna help you out. For those who don't understand what you're trying to do, you then start putting the restrictions on where they can actually go anyways. So if you lock down certain sites, certain countries, certain places, you're gonna limit your exposure to, to the bad actors, the, the bad people out there. The other thing that's gonna be important is you not only need the next gen firewall, that's mm -hmm. critical because your next gen firewalls can have your intrusion detection and prevention. So those are tools to help you. It's after the fact, they're already knocking at your door at that point, but you need those kind of tools to help you. But you also need to have a second firewall because if you don't have a failover capability, that first one goes out, you're exposed the whole time that you're waiting for the next one to come in or the next, <clears throat> you're exposed until the next firewall gets set up. You need to have that in standby mode. It needs to be automatic or your business is completely down. You hear about it, you see that Office 365 has gone down. You see that, I'm gonna pick on other companies. You see where they, 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 go, they go down and it's usually human error or failure to prepare. So properly configured next generation firewall is key once you get past user training and employee behavior. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Greg knows about that. You couldn't ask Greg this question? <laughs> I got an answer for yeah. that. Uh, hopefully, uh, if best practice and your own personal recommendation isn't valid enough or you need uh, accompanying information, the next thing is hopefully you can find a good price. Um, if you can't find a good price, hopefully it's, it's client driven or the market that you, that you operate in has a determination or terms that they expect that you to follow as a provider, vendor, whatever your role is in, in business that kind of requires it. So for in our line of work, we represent a lot of institutions that require a standard. We go through hundreds of audits per year. And it's not like, hey, are you doing this? It's on site, prove, show them what you have, et cetera. And you have to go most restrictive. And you can tell which of these clients are really paying attention to security and which ones aren't. And so you kind of have to be on top of it. Hopefully your line of business had something like that to kind of give you a guide for your industry. But beyond that, there are standards and there are best practices, whether it's government or think tanks, there, there's, a, there's a guide you can follow so that it can be beyond your own words, your own perspective. There are people out there that can help you make the argument. Well, I am curious to know what, what your answer is going to be. Uh, scare them to death. <laughs> <laughs> Find stories that are of, in, in our industry, legal field, and, and bring it home um, because that has been for us what registers mm -hmm. most strongly. And then that translates in what, what the technological solution is. But yeah, they, they need to be scared and they need to start preaching the story <laughs> rather than just tolerating listening to you about it, yeah. which as <clears throat> Jason mentioned, client driven. To me, that's been a godsend over the last couple of years in that the uh, client audits require that you do such and so, something that I would have recommended before. And they said, it's kind of like insurance, right? We don't really need to do that. Yeah. And uh, But when the client who's a piece of, of the uh, income stream yes. says, thou shalt, Cares then, more you know, it, this is a client requirement. We have to do it. It, it has, we, we call it painful growth for us. It's been, you know, things that we've had to do security wise that we ideally would have done anyway, uh, but but with the help of the client, you you get there. And, and I would add that we talk a lot about theory and theoretical attacks and things in these types of forums, but there is a lot of real life stories yeah. that can scare the crap out of management if you need to find them. Well, actually, we'll, we'll take a step past that. Yeah. You're being attacked right now while you're at this launch. Mm -hmm. If you have the tools to look, you will see what kind of attacks are happening on your network right, right now. now? Now, I assume they're not successful, otherwise you guys would be running out the door. <laughs> but it's happening right now, it's happening all the time. And I think Greg said they only have to be right once. That's the case, it's happening all the time while you're asleep, while you're awake, while you're away, while you're working on it, mm -hmm. everything. You have to be careful when you're making adjustments just so they don't get in while you're making a tweak. I mean, you have to be careful, it's always going on. Mm -hmm. Thank you for all those all those thoughts. Uh, we just like to point out that you know 
with a lot of these tools that we're going to talk about, they are there's a kind of a, a threshold or a sweet spot. So a smaller organization, they might be they might appear to be ex more exp and they are more expensive because there's a certain level of investment that you have to do to to get the device or the tool. Uh, in the case of firewalls, you know, a typical firewall will run from if you were going to buy one, it would run from probably a thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars, and and that range would cover like five users to you know four hundred or five hundred users. So you can see a big a big gap there, and that that initial investment for that small company might be you know might be a little steep. Um, or there's a there's a, a new uh, mainstream offers a firewall as a service where we will we will <clears throat> give you a firewall for a for a monthly uh, lease charge and manage it for you. Do these configurations that these guys were talking about. And you know that typically runs, uh, you know, between seventy or two hundred and seventy dollars a month for those same that same range of device. So just to kind of give you an idea of where the where the cost range is for that foundational layer, of the firewall. Can I interject something here? Yeah. Um, so he's giving these numbers. Also keep in mind, if you have your second firewall, we haven't even talked about DR, where you're going to need two firewalls there too. So that ten thousand can be forty thousand real quick. You know, it, it, it all adds up. Yep. Good point. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Putting in firewalls opposed to a lease, yeah, I would assume that there would need to be periodic upgrades to mm -hmm. require. So, you, would you be better off in a lease type of scenario? Or, I mean, if you're having to reinvest to build that wall ever so often. Well, that, that's, a, that's part of the as a service model is that, you know, typically anytime you see as a service in any kind of offering, part of the, the value proposition of that is that you're always getting the new. The new ver the new, the latest upgrade, or the uh, if there's patches that come out, they're automatically applied. And, and when that, when that particular device reaches into life, then you know that just rolls into the newer device. So, whereas if you're buying the device, then you're obviously into a, a capital refresh and that kind of. So I would answer. add something to that, Go ahead. Johnny. Um, that <clears throat> when you um, get that as a service, you're probably getting for most little companies a higher level of expertise. That somebody that's focused on it, like yeah. you, um, to uh, to get the you know whether in a small place you've got a couple IT guys and they're wearing many hats and they're trying to you know scrape the surface of security when you um, you know have it as a service and I think in general that you're getting some some built-in expertise there that would be hard to duplicate uh, in the organization. So now at our best, I'm sure there's lots of experts, but you know, I think you're <laughs> yeah. a smaller company yeah. where you know. It, it may not Yeah, these aren't like so a your new flat screen TV so that you're basically unboxing it and <laughs> plugging it in. There's some there's some work involved in, in getting those getting them up and running and configured right. So you, you also know what your cost is gonna be. We haven't mentioned that every year you have a renewal on that firewall or on that equipment that you have to re up. You don't have to worry about forecasting in four years. I now have to, you know, shell out another forty thousand dollars for the latest model. I don't have to then train my staff on how to work and, and understand the differences between it. Um, you get the leverage knowledge, so you have your in-house knowledge, then you have with software as a service, you get to pair that. And then uh, the other kind of aspect of that is, Greg was talking about people wearing many hats. Something I always recommend to people, and one of the things I tell my executive committee, thanks to Mark's question earlier, um, when you hear all these titles in IT, usually these, are, these can be standalone positions. And sometimes you have to remember that that person standing over there is wearing eight of those titles. And mm. so their loyalty or understanding or whatever is provisioned as much as those titles are. And so you're only going to get so much expertise, expertise yeah. experience, et cetera. So <clears throat> you might want to keep that in mind when it comes to cost and, and things like that. One okay. last thing. Uh, we typically see the firewall will last around five years to seven years, and then it starts to age and will need to be replaced. So that's a typical <clears throat> lifetime that we see. Um, you get that scary end of life notification. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so vendors will stop supporting them, and you certainly don't want to have a product that the vendor doesn't support because if a vulnerability comes out, then there's nothing you can do about it. So you want to replace those periodically. And if your firewall is over five, you need to take a look at it. Good points. So, and the, the, the panel alluded to this, you know, but so the, you know, when the firewall has absolutely no holes in it, it's a great firewall. I mean, it's doing its job, you know, but no holes is not realistic because, you know, as Greg mentioned, you know, 
that email had to come through one of those holes in the firewall for somebody to click on it. And that browsing activity had to go out through a hole to, uh, to, to get the, to this malicious site. So you can't run your business. I mean, if you installed the firewall and it had no holes, it was deny all, you can't do your business. There's no point in having the computer. So, you know, so you need, you need holes for things like email and browsing. Um, but those same holes are what the, the attackers know what those holes are, and that's why most of the attacks that they are doing are, are crafted to take advantage of these standard holes that everyone punches in their firewall. So you need, you need more, that's, this is where the additional layers to the defense come in. You need things to backstop the firewall to plug these holes and keep the holes from exploiting within your, your system. So the next layer we're gonna talk about is email protection. That is, you know, that is like the most common vector for attack is trying to, uh, is uh, phishing emails, uh, emails that deliver malware. Uh, so wanted to ask the panel, you know, what are, what are some uh, email protections that, that you recommend or that you, uh, that you have in place? Sorry. We'll start with the, start, start um, with Jason this time. <laughs> The uh, we're we're a big fan of Mimecast. I don't know if any of you use that, but it's a it, it's a whole family of uh, of protection from spam um, to uh, malicious links. Uh, and one of my favorites is called Attachment Protect. Basically, they sandbox and run a, a, a unknown attachment, and this is the way zero day viruses are caught. So often we'll get a report that a an attachment that they caught and ran in the sandbox before it ever got to us was doing was starting cryptographic services and calling home and you know doing things that were obviously evil were never intended to be uh, to be run on your system. So um, I, um, I I tell people Mimecast is one of the best bargains for security that that we've put in place. And just to give you some even with like John's uh, caveat about the base cost of getting into it. Um, <clears throat> Mimecast, uh, uh, your URL protection, in other words, your user clicks on a link, these are all protected, Mimecast vets it out before they get there to determine if it's malicious or not, and blocks it if, if it is something other than uh, you know, a valid link. Uh, that costs about $30 per user per year. Um, the attachment protects about the same thing, um, but that's a, an astounding product, and the, the battle there is why did you why did you stop my attachment? I need that attachment. I know the sender, and you know we actually run into situations where all three criteria were met: of uh, you know the sender, you, you're expecting the file, it's necessary for your work, you release it, comes through, and it's malicious because the good client, you know, we should whitelist the good client because um, they're a good client, but they have malware on their system that's intercepting the outbound file, you know, making it malicious, and you get it and you pay the price there. Um, so Mimecast also has, you know, basic spam protection and then an impersonation product as well. You know, when you're, you're common, you know, CFO to CEO whaling kind of messages to prevent that east-west uh, uh, illegitimate traffic inside your, inside your company. That's, a, that's about an $8 a year cost. The spam protection is about $24.00. Then they've got several, or one other feature at least that we use, Jason can talk to this, our Mimecast people as well, but um, email continuity where uh, your email is also s stored on their servers before it arrives to you, your system goes down. People are still able to work through the web and through their mobile phone for a set period, not, not forever, but say 90 days of retention. Uh, they can still answer emails and author new emails. Um, so it keeps you going in a, say a, a, a short, uh, interruption uh, if you don't have another failover method. So um, it kind of addresses a number of things about, about email protection, but um, uh, a good product. I recommend that one, that one highly. Yeah, there, since uh, we also use Mimecast and we use the same features, we use a couple other features. Um, it's really about protecting your end users from themselves. <laughs> um, Absolutely. It's hard to do. We're thinking about it all the time. Um, they have things such as strip and link attachment feature, uh, jumbo or large file sends. So instead of you sending a large file to someone, um, you can basically upload it. You send them a link. They can download it. You can get read receipts. You can brand the page the way uh, your marketing needs to look. They log in. It's secure. You know they got it. They can't get to it again. 
or you can allow them access to it for a day, a month, three months, whatever. So you have different options there. You get, uh, just log in real quick, you're far enough away you can't read it, but you get little dashboards, you have little uh, matrices that let you kind of know what's happening, where it's going. But I think the most important thing for us, besides the obvious uh, features that Greg laid out that are just super beneficial, is knowing what your peers, your, your employees, your users are doing. And that comes into content cool. filtering. That's the biggest thing in, in, in our eyes. We identify what clients will you probably email? What are our biggest clients? What are their domains? What uh, IP addresses do they use for their DR, DR site, et cetera? And you kind of build in these formulas, these rules that say, okay, I'll accept emails from this person under these conditions, and I will give it not quite a pass, but I'll make a little less restrictive because it's more important and we have different filters on it. I will not let you send anything with PII data in it to anybody but these uh, addresses. If it's going to someone else, it's gonna get flagged and not only flagged to you saying, hey, why are you sending this? It goes to your supervisor. So if you are doing something nefarious, they understand, they see it, and they have to put in a ticket with IT to get that released. And depending on your station or your role, you as a supervisor still may not have permission to release it. You have to get someone higher up. So when you cause bad behavior, or you do things, whether it's intentional or not, the right people find out about it, the right people get involved so that they can make the decision that we want to allow this to go through or not. And if you don't want to annoy your executives, or if you are the executive and you don't want to be annoyed, you'll put a stop to it really quick. But putting in those kind of controls and understanding your business is really important. So, Daniel? Sure. Um, and everything these guys talked about with the Mimecast, realize there are a lot of different layers to that product. You have the content filtering, the link filtering, attachment filtering, spam filtering. And you can get these types of layers in a lot of different products. Uh, your next gen firewall can include some of those. Does that mean go with one and not the other? No, I say go with both. The more layers you have, the better off you're going to be. Uh, for example, Greg talked about an attachment being sent. It met all the criteria they expected, so they released it. It got caught by the next layer, which was the antivirus. So layers on top of layers is very important because things will get through. Machines aren't perfect. People aren't perfect. Um, the other thing is DNS filtering, um, which will work not just with email, but anytime you're browsing the internet, when you go to a link, Mimecast does this from the email where the URL is tested to see if it's a known malicious site. You can have that same layer added to your browsing of the internet with DNS filtering. We use a product, um, name escapes me for a minute. An umbrella. Umbrella, open DNS uh, product from Umbrella is the one we use, very inexpensive per user cost and it sits where your DNS server goes out to resolve names. So it'll intercept all of that. There's an agent you can put on laptops so it will travel with people when they go to a hotel. They're still protected, even if they're not on your network. So just wanted to add those pieces. And I um, want to add there that, again, um, mainstream doesn't use Mimecast, but we believe so strongly in the importance of all these email, this email protection layer that if you're a managed services customer with mainstream, those tools are just included kind of by default. Mm -hmm. um, it's baked into our price and there's no opting out of it. You know, if you're, you're not willing to, you know, e email is such a huge vector for attack that we just out of the box are going to protect that way. And, and the, uh, the suite of tools that, that mainstream uses, it, the prices are all similar for these products, you know, depending, uh, from vendor to vendor, once you're, once you're accumulating anti-spam and antivirus and, and filtering and, and, uh, then you're all end up in that same that same kind of price per user ballpark that, that Greg was talking to. So again, the probably the next the next biggest layer and uh, the panel again is they're staying one step ahead of me here. Um, is you know another huge vector you know second place is is and it often goes hand in hand with the email attacks is um, malicious websites spoofed websites that where the user clicks on a link and gets taken and, and either that's uh, an opportunity to divulge credentials or sensitive information or uh, worse to download malicious uh, software into your environment. 
So that next layer on top of, on top of email protection is what, what I call browsing protection. And um, Daniel was talking about Umbrella, but wanted to hear what, uh, what you two had to say about it. I would add on to um, Umbrella two functions that make sense to everyone. Two things it does are it uh, checks to see if the domain was born in the last 48 hours, I think. Mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, if it's brand new, it's suspicious. It also checks a cross-reference to see if the owner of the domain is a bad actor, you know, because, you know, these guys buy domains that can't hide their identity forever. So those two criteria right out there in front um, to be examined when, when, a, um, uh, when that side has tried to, uh, when you try to reach it. Um, the other thing to throw in about Umbrella, it is a Cisco product now, but it came from a product called OpenDNS, which uh, we had, we've advised our home, our users at home to put in place. You mm -hmm. can, with minor um, uh, knowledge, you can uh, sign into your router and change your DNS lookup site to be open DNS. And then you have this protection at home as well as, uh, as well as at work. Speaking of at home and, and email and all that, uh, do, uh, can I just ask you all, do, who prohibits um, webmail on their on their systems at work? Completely prohibits it, if you don't mind uh, telling me. Like you can't go to Gmail, you can't go to Yahoo, that, that sort of thing. You could use Gmail. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's different, the business yeah. version, you know, but do you all prohibit people from going checking their webmail in general? Because we think about all these layers of protecting our email and so forth, and one of the we the vulnerabilities is we don't have very little in front of Gmail or Yahoo. It's just a website, mm -hmm. you know. So a lot of stuff can enter that way that maybe can't make it if you're using your uh, your your business um, email systems. So that's just another thing to think about is in terms of locking down and in like like you said, just the general deny aspect of. Um, uh, of the whole nature of the beast. It, it's been a hard concept to get across. Two years ago, my executive team wouldn't hear of blocking Facebook or blocking Twitter or blocking these things. Now they're all behind it. You know, we can do it on our iPads. We can do, you know, we do it on a, on a separate wireless network to keep that influence out of, the, out of the firm network. So you just look at every aspect of how you can protect uh, your company's digital resources and try to block them. But, yeah, if... I'm just gonna stick with that. Go into Facebook, go into Twitter, go into instant messaging, go into blog this, that, and the other, go into any of these places. It's leaving your doors and your windows, or leaving your windows open, but you're locking your doors. I mean, that content filtering we were speaking about earlier, these other protections we were speaking about earlier, it doesn't matter if you can come in through the window. You've got to think about what kind of technology is out there and you have to think about the motivations of the people that are trying to cause these issues. They're gonna to look to see if your window's open. There are more and more programs out there that emulate what you do as a person. So if you have gotten compromised and someone writes a program that says, automatically open this website, fill in these credentials, do a brute force attack from within the environment and try to get to these sites and they get into your Gmail, your Facebook, or this and the other, you're done. Because one, you had access in the first place, the level, the amount of time and resources you're gonna put in to try to find out what happened is gonna be way too late. The damage is already done. You may not realize for months because it's not something that you're monitoring. Um, it may mean that certain people have a responsibility to do your social media marketing and things like that. Give them access, put them on a, on a quarantine network or their own VLANs or just any other. There's ways to do it. You don't have to go without, but you need to protect yourself and not just, well, this person needs it so everybody can have it. You know, you want to be as restrictive as possible, which goes back to the whole concept of a firewall. Don't open any port unless you have to. Don't allow users access to anything they don't have to have. If certain users have to have access to things, create a group of like-minded individuals as far as resources and things they need to go to, put them in their own section and create interior interior firewalls to protect you from their behavior. Don't expose the whole firm to it. So, great point. Good input. Well, uh, just to explain how Umbrella gets their information, how do they know who's a bad actor? Um, as part of Cisco, they have little taps all over the world across the internet. So they are watching internet traffic 
365. So they see attacks as they start to unfold and they pull that real threat data live to update Umbrella. Uh, so within a short period of time of a new attack breaking out, someone registers a new domain, they're gonna have block rules in their product. So it's important to have a product that is updated constantly, not one that gets updates once a month. Thank you. And um, I think kind of a theme that went, or a thread that went through all three of their, their statements there um, was that while this, this DNS filtering or, or content filtering is a, is a tool that you deploy, there's, there's policy and there's process aspects that add uh, additional layers and really enhance the value of those tools or the, or the capability of those tools by bulkheading off your, your systems, you know, to, to, you know, to, it's kind of the Titanic model. And on one hand, the Titanic is a horrible model because it sank. <laughs> but on the other hand, if you looked at the design of the Titanic, it was designed to, to take a pretty healthy lick before it sank. And it, it just took a bigger lick than it was designed for. Um, so at the, uh, and I, I guess, you know, to, to finish this off, you know, the, we talked about umbrella and, um, you know, umbrella ends up costing about, you know, three and a half bucks a, a device per month. So, uh, it's a, a again. A, you start seeing that none of these layers are prohibitively expensive, uh, and when you add them up, you know it's 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 a mix and match kind of deal as far as what you want to bite off first and and how you want to proceed. But again, that's still not enough. So there's you know once they're into your network or another attack uh, tactic that they use is uh, brute force attacks where they are just either they're just hammering on your firewall on the boundary to your system, trying to find a weakness, or they're leveraging some information that they already know. If they've, if they've gotten your, your user ID from a, from a list that they, they bought on the, on the dark web, if they think they know some credentials and you have external logins available, they're, they're hammering trying to, trying to crack your password, trying to, trying to get into your system that way. So there's another layer there that, is, that protects against these brute force uh, attacks. And I guess some, you know, I'll, I'll throw out some, some uh, tools that, that we have um, and see what your thoughts on them are is uh, the first one is a uh, multi-factor authentication and maybe somebody explain what what MFA does and, and uh, why it's good. Sure, I'll, I'll jump on that one first. Um, a lot of companies you can get your email at work through a web browser at home so you can hit webmail. Uh, you may have a VPN that you can log into from home. It takes a username and password. Well, the problem is I can go buy username and passwords online cheap, or I can guess them over and over and over again, and eventually, if I guess right, I can log in. So anything you have on your internal network that's exposed, that accepts a username and password, can be attacked over and over again, brute force attack. What multi-factor authentication does, it adds one more piece of information that you have to use to log in that typically is constantly changing. You may have heard carrying around a token. Uh, what has occurred these days is it's matured so that you have applications you can carry on your cell phone that are tied to that device and your login, and you typically keep your cell phone with a password on it. Uh, so your username, password, and a specific device, whether that's a number you type in or it could just the device says, is that really you that's trying to log in? And you say, yep, that's me, and it lets you in but it's that third factor typically that you use to enhance the logins. So it, just a username and password will not work by itself. Yeah, it's typically, I think it's something you have, something you know, or, or some statement like that. It's mm -hmm. you know what one of the passwords are you have to receive and you have in your possession something that's uh, temporary or, or limited. And then you have to have, again, the access and to know how to log into it and where to log into it and when you can log into it. So. If you add login restrictions, you can only log in from the state or from this country. You can only log in during these hours, uh, depending on what your role is. You can't log in remotely. Um, you can put a lot of controls out there as far as limiting your exposure to risk. Yeah, a, a mature multi-factor product, as Jason said, if it knows I live in Little Rock, Arkansas, and it sees the login coming from Little Rock, Arkansas, I can have this set of criteria. If it sees an attempt from China or Russia or California, I can have an enhanced set of criteria. So the products come a long way in the last few years. What would yeah, you I would add even add, 
at our table, we're talking about Mount, Mount Ida, Arkansas. It knows that if you're not in Little Rock and you're Mount, in Mount Ida and sends you a separate message to say, is this really you? Because you're in a different location mm -hmm. than you typically are. But I would, um, you know, we've kind of taken the approach that everything that's exposed outside has multi-factor authentication on it. And I would encourage you also when you're doing your personal things, especially banking, if it's offered, do it. Don't, don't click set up later. Go through that right now. And, and set up <laughs> everything. Harvest everybody. <laughs> and I don't know if we'll get to it. Do you have passwords on your list, Johnny? Mm -mm. Oh, well, gee whiz. Uh, <laughs> don't make your password something simple. You know, you talk about guessing passwords, brute force kind of things. Uh, you know, you hear about a dictionary attack. It's just a program that tries all the words together until it comes up with, uh, you know, what, what yours is. It happens. Don't. Make the password, obviously, the biggest, one of the biggest weaknesses there is people use the same password yes. everywhere. <laughs> or they, change, they put a number on the end. Uh, I, am, uh, I am passionate about uh, LastPass or any other password manager that stores your passwords in an encrypted, secure way, such that you only have to know one password, and that's your master password. Everything else is mm -hmm. encrypted and secured and is inserted automatically. Um, but uh, you know, one of the biggest weaknesses, everybody uses a, the same password over and over again. Don't endanger your company by using your personal password to as your network credentials. Um, it, it's, it's a hard nut to crack because you can't necessarily know what people are doing. Sure. Um, password on your phone, 1111, yeah. doesn't work so well uh, when somebody else picks it up. So. Um, yeah, if it wasn't on the agenda, I would say uh, that's a real key ingredient to all this is the uh, security of, of passwords. So as a as a firm, we've adopted an enterprise version of, of LastPass, and adoption rate's not so great at this point. We're trying to get everybody there. Um, key selling point is only have to know one password. Just don't forget it, because then... <laughs> And then you got to go do, I forgot password at every site you have. But uh, and, and, and stop freely sharing your passwords with your IT staff. They have other ways they can get in. They'll have permission. They'll reset your password, change it. Because you don't know that I might have that employee on a process improvement plan, and next week he may be fired, and he has your password because you decided to share with them because you couldn't get your screensaver to work. If, if they need it, they'll ask for it. Let them write it out, document it, why they needed it. You need to change it afterwards, et cetera. Just because you're used to them, don't get comfortable, you know, Take value in that because if something goes wrong, it's it's going to be on you, not that person. So, yeah. Um, and my wife hates me because our <laughs> password's at home. <laughs> so if you have not used a password manager in the past, uh, Greg talked about LastPass. There's one password. There's a number of them. They're very easy to use in that they will fill out the username and passwords for you from your secure vault. So it, it's not one of those where, oh, let me log into LastPass and get my password and then type it in. It, it takes care of all that for you. So it's very easy uh, and acceptable for people who don't like to be bothered with the troubles of security. I would, I would add to that <laughs> that once, uh, once you get comfortable with it, it generates passwords. You don't yeah, ever yeah. even have to know what they are. Mm -hmm. Generate, insert, use this one. I never know that it's a string of gobbledygook. It just it it did at the time I'm doing a change password, saved it in my last pass, mm -hmm. and all I have to do is click on the link to go to my bank site. I know my password's different than all my others, and it's not guessable. I mean, un, under easy conditions. Yeah. Um, so I strongly encourage you to look at it both yeah. personally and and for your business. And that's a, another key feature of that is it once you've loaded your different accounts, all the different sites that you visit into it, it will. It will search your vault and it will point out that, hey, you've used the same password in these three sites. So you might want to change two of them to be different passwords. So it, it does a security assessment on all your profile to help you be as secure as possible. And yeah. it's cheap. It is cheap. Yes. Yeah, it's really cheap. To reiterate where we started with multi-factor authentication <laughs> and what Greg was saying, if you missed that, is enable it if you can on everything, even if it's personal. And anywhere in a business that you have something exposed to the internet that accepts your username and password, put it there as well. It will enhance your security. Yes. Oh, it's scary. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I set up extra devices for people often. Mm -hmm. Have any idea why Apple will show me three states to the east? And by the time I catch the end user to say I need that code, I have to 
says in another code because they've denied it because it's in Virginia or somewhere else. Why? I think it has to do with routing on the server. Yeah, the, the internet service provider that is providing the IP address to that device or the one it's seen on the outside is associated with somewhere else. So, for example, on my cell phone, AT&T, if I go do a lookup on the IP address that AT&T gives my phone, it's often in Dallas or Denver. Mm -hmm. It's not Arkansas. And that's just the way they registered their information from the internet service provider. That explains it. I, I've never understood that, but I battle it all the time mm -hmm. before I can get the end user to give me the code. They've denied it. And I'm like, well, that's not where I am. Give it to me anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One other, um, on the, still on the brute force part is, you know, a one reason these brute force attacks work is once they once they get into the environment, they leverage existing vulnerabilities, be it unpatched software, uh, be it bad configurations, just weaknesses inside that that firewall that that uh, are well known. They're they're documented out in public, and hackers write code to take advantage of these weaknesses. Um, what about you know so? You know, a tool we use and, and deploy uh, for customers at Mainstream is a vulnerability scanner mm -hmm. um, to help us understand exactly where we are at risk from some from software that's not getting patched or or configurations that have that have been uh, fat fingered. And yeah. what what are your thoughts on? This a must have. I had a situation this week uh, where I was able to give one of my desktop people a little bit of kudos because they're doing their job and I have to rely on them to do it. Where we run our scans to see what's what's shown up on our environment. There shouldn't be anything new or approved, not approved through IT. There's a, an application in, uh, installed, it looked suspicious. The person that had installed the application was in a position to where if they had bad intentions, that could be used uh, to do bad things. So we immediately locked that box down, removed it, started a protocol where, okay, I'm gonna notify uh, their head of department, I'm gonna notify employee services, HR, we're gonna go through the whole gamut, even though the more I looked into, the more I'm thinking, I think I know why they did this, but I'm not gonna make an assumption. We're gonna go through the process, and that person had to uh, have a meeting to the side, was kind of stood up, walked out in front of everybody, and everything was like, what's going on? Because if I'm there and some other people are there, like something's up. So everybody's looking, it just turns out they'd forgotten their password, they downloaded a tool that's for Excel to do certain things, but you can't do that. And so even though you have a little bit more elevated permissions to do a few things on your box, you can't go and do things and, and that are troublesome. So even though this person's in a quarantine area, uh, as far as what their job function is, even though this person has certain permissions to do things, they still found a way to do something that they thought was a part of their job. But for me, looking at it from a negative standpoint, saw that that could have caused problems. I had to have all these other th these controls in place because you can't fix everything or, or block everything. So you gotta allow everybody to do their, their job function. To see that, to realize it was happening, find out about it in real time, and then start going through the motions. But if you don't have those tools in place that are scanning, if you don't have someone who, this is the biggest thing to me, reviewing and looking at the events that you're scanning, it doesn't matter if you have this big database of information, if nobody's parsing through it or you don't have a system that's augmenting through it and helping you look at all that, that information to make determinations about it, you're gonna be stuck. But you have to have something always looking, you have to have somebody in, responsible or in charge for coming through that data, mm -hmm. so. Sure. Um, looking at the anatomy of how the hackers actually get things to work, it almost always involves a vulnerability or unpatched software. So they click a link, it goes to a website that has malicious code and that code's going to take advantage of a vulnerability on your machine. It could be out of date Java, it could be out of date Adobe Flash or one of those products. Uh, if they download a malicious attachment and open the document, it's gonna work because your Microsoft Word is not updated. If those products are kept up to date, a lot of times those attacks will not succeed, even if the user makes a mistake and clicks on something. So keeping your software products up to date, very important. Having a tool that can scan your devices to tell you what's out of date is really the only way that you can make this work because a human looking at every device every day 
for 150,000 plus different vulnerabilities is non-realistic. Yeah, I would add, um, like Jason mentioned, you know, there can be things going on in one part of your system where there's a, a use of a password, you know, uh, trying to log onto a machine that that person doesn't typically log on to. Uh, we found it impossible to analyze these events uh, internally. Um, it's a, under a family of products called SIEM or SIEM, S-I-E-M, System Information Event Management, that is doing, it's extracting data from all over your system. We use a as a service for this because it's impossible, like you said, yeah. for a person to do. And that software, with some degree of artificial intelligence, analyzes these apparent disparate events and ties them together and creates an alert. Mm -hmm. um, so this, as Jason says, ha can happen in real time that you get a notification that this is going on, there's this vulnerability, or, or there's been this escalation of privilege, you know, someone has been promoted to an administrator that you know nothing about. So. Uh, a, a result of malicious code in, in operation. Um, and uh, we use, uh, um, just to put a, a name and some pricing with it, um, a service called Arctic Wolf. If you've, if you've heard of them, they offer both the, the SIM piece and um, the vulnerability scanning in a package that is one of the more expensive mm -hmm. per user costs. I think uh, uh, that came in for us at about $240 a user a year. So it's, it's a little higher up. Um, so all these things, of course, add up as you as you go down the list of uh, of, uh, of security protections. Um, uh, and is there a point we talk about our general budget for this in in this, Johnny? Or is that no? We're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not to budget today. We're what? We're not in budget today. We're not in budget today. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would just say one statement. Then look at what you're spending and compare yourself to the industry. It's kind of a kind of a threshold of am I doing enough with security or am I doing very little? Uh, anyway, yeah, I wanted to add one more thing on uh, how these attacks succeed. A lot of people will have local admin rights on their device at work. Mm -hmm. And if they do not have a business reason for that, that's not a good idea. Because if everything's up to date and patched, the vulnerability may still be able to insert itself the attack may be able to insert itself because that user is an administrator on that device. So something to consider if your users have local admin on their workstations is can you take that away from them and them still function and do their job? Usually the answer is yes, you might have to do a little work to get there, but that's also a good layer to add. If a piece of software is written that requires an admin to run it, it goes on the wall of shame. Yes, you, know, they're, they're, they're you just, don't need that's, that that's so so old old school at this point. You yeah. do not want a local admin anywhere on the system because if they can install a product, which what local ad, admin rights let them do, so can a piece of automated malicious software mm -hmm. install a product. So yeah, that's a definite do not do. If you've got local admin rights, get rid of them and rename your local admin, all your administrator accounts. Don't call them administrator. Call them something else. Yep. <laughs> Good points. Yeah. So moving on, and 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 Greg, you you uh, you jumped ahead of us on this right off the gate Sorry. this morning on the, you know, so that that last component there it, that these attacks are leveraging are human beings. You know, the weakest link in your security strategy. You know, humans were you know we're horrible. We're inconsistent. We can't follow rules. Uh, we're forgetful. Um, we um, so there's you know Greg, you talked about you talked about the no before as as a training package. Um, that's also what mainstream deploys for, for our customers. Um, uh, Jason, do you have anything to, uh, I use a product called Atata, A-T-A-A-T-A, -A -A -A. um, basically does the same thing. It, you can set up campaigns where, you know, this month, I think it's, you know, fishing and you kind of get a little video and then you get like, you must watch this video. They get automated reminders. If they haven't watched, you kind of get a report and then we'll send out these little fake emails, pretend it's shipping, pretend it's. A letter or you won the lotto or whatever it is if somebody clicks on the link they get a funny little picture and they have to go to kind of remedial training and then it shows up kind of in a report that everybody gets to to see and our executives don't care too much about that yet unless it's one of their somebody in their their umbrella okay. but uh it, it, it's catching up and it's kind of it's it's cute but it's not cute um these videos are actually funny uh the ones that atata puts out uh it's kind of a office setting usually, and then there's like a guy kind of dressed in a bathrobe, kind of 
a little more slob. He's like, go ahead and do it. Press the button. Go ahead and do it. You know, and, and so they have these little debates, whatever. But I mean, it engages the employees. But I mean, you get the software, but then you have employees that are sitting out in the open. So you've got to buy them speakers or headphones or different things. You've got to kind of prepare for it. But I mean, you want to be invested in, in your success. So. Yeah, and, I, and as Greg mentioned, you know, the, the cost of the tool ends up being, uh, you know, about $15 a year per person. Um, in this training as a service model that that mainstream deploys the product through ends up being about two dollars a user a month is and that that's us doing you know setting up which videos and training and all that so uh, again that's a, another crucial layer because the final layer once I've gotten through all these other things there's that one oh crap moment where somebody clicked on the wrong email and it's going to happen yeah. and and I would add with no before for example I'm sure that Atata has it as well you can create different groups for different training so I can do targeted training for C-level. I can do targeted training for marketing. I can do targeted training for developers. So it's not just one size fits all. It can be customized for your needs. Uh, if you need HIPAA training, it can do that. If you need PCI training, it can do that. So just know that it's adaptable for your needs based on your business. Yeah. And two more things uh, based on value. Uh, one thing I don't think we've said so far, and it applies I think almost everything we've said, What's the cost of not doing it? Oh, yes. Good point. We're not just talking reputation. We're not talking about replacement of equipment. We're not talking about man hours. We're not talking about contracting in specialists. You're talking about all of that. If something goes down, you're not prepared. And the front end, it might have been a lot less expensive to, to take that on. And then there's also the value. And if you're to use a mainstream, we don't have that for, for this particular feature. But we get spread thin often. You know, a new project shows up that you weren't expecting, but you still have to get ready for this campaign for next month. And you have to rewrite your emails and customize it. And you have the multiple groups. And so while I was doing this campaign for finance, I was in this campaign for IT, EC, whatever. If you can kind of take that off your plate, there are times where I'm like, oof, I wish I would have software as a service this or I would have done. It, it kind of marries. And sometimes you got to pull out of my dead cold hands to get me to release it. But... <laughs> Oftentimes when I do do that, I'm just like, okay, I'm glad that's gone because it's just, hey, does somebody do this? Cool, I'm good, I can move on. It's a to-do list that's done, so. And to piggyback on that with the Know Before product, we don't write the emails. We don't even know what they look like until one of the department heads says, why did my, what did it look like? What engaged my employee to click on that? And then we can pull it up, but it's so automated that the people don't get the same email. So it's not like, hey, did you get that email? You know, talking to their neighbor, everybody kind of mm -hmm. has to make their own decision. So it really is a hands-off, I've now offloaded this, but it's a sophisticated function the way, the way it works. So, so they uh, are constantly updating the phishing email simulations that they send out, uh, often with current events. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna see stuff about the elections, you're gonna see uh, things that people are emotional about and they're gonna click. Um, Coronavirus, there's one that no before has for that. Yeah. So then <laughs> heading toward the finish line here and nearing well, one o'clock, so I want to be conscious of everyone's time, but kind of that, that capstone on top of this layer defense that we're building is, is detection. And, and Greg mentioned uh, SIEM, a SIM, SIM tool for something that's monitoring. And, and as we've also talked a couple of times, is it's humanly impossible with the, the sheer volume of events, once you get a network of any size, uh, the number of attacks that are happening, the number of things that are going on inside your network legitimately, it's humanly impossible to, to screen and you know, accurately analyze uh, this, this environment. So you, these tools are built to troll through its, you know, they're big data tools. They troll through mounds of, of log files to correlate these events. And they are, as Greg mentioned, they're typically on the high end of the, of the scale. Uh, they're, they're very sophisticated tools. And they're, and they're a little pricey, but they're, like I said, they're the capstone. So once you're doing everything you can to protect your environment, that last step is making sure that you're keeping your eyes open so that you're alerted when, when you are actually under attack or when someone has broken in. Um, so then wrapping up, you know, kind of final thoughts. Um, you know, the firewall is an essential foundation. You gotta have holes in the firewall though. And that's where, you know, you gotta have these extra layers of protection. Email and browsing require extra precautions. Um, still some more tools are necessary to prevent brute force attacks from, from being successful. 
And then, you know, finally, training is a, is a good idea to help, help protect that human component of your, of your defense. And then that, that capstone, you know, it's, it's good to protect, but you have to, you have to keep your eyes open. You have to have somebody watching out to uh, let you know when, when you're under attack. Um, yeah, I want to say one thing quickly. No matter how many layers you put in place, something's going to get through. And if you don't have the detection to know when it got through, then they're going to be successful. And that's why the sim is the cap. Well, uh, can I go ahead? Yeah. Can I cap the sim? Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, there, the average time before a institution discovers hackers been in their system is uh, some ridiculous number, like Months. 80, 100 days. You know, they've been in doing damage for a while before they're typically mm -hmm. discovered. You know, that, that's the phrase. You, you've either been hacked or, you know, and you know it, or you've been hacked and you don't know it yet. You know, so uh, the one other detection tool, we use a, a, a software that falls in a family called Deceptive Technology. And it basically basically creates replicas of servers, users, password lists, and the bots that are hitting these things from the outside looking for vulnerabilities cannot recognize the difference between a replica and the real thing. So instead of getting uh, figuring it out six or three months later that somebody's been in your system, you actually get a warning when they are attempting to to get into the system. And so we, we collectively call the, or we we call that class of two a honeypots. Yep. That's yeah. a honeypot. So you, yeah, you set one out to attract the bees, and yeah. and you, then you know when yeah. they're in the yard. And one thing I'd like to add: if there's decision makers in the room, support your IT staff and have a conversation with them as far as what can you guys do to help support them be successful. You also need to challenge them because they're going to come from a place of being defensive. Well, I know this, or I'm really busy, or whatever. You don't want to risk the business based on them not pay, placing the proper amount of importance on something, them not thinking they don't have support with leadership or the decision makers when it comes to budgets or finance. You need to make sure that that person knows what they're doing. And if they don't know what they're doing, if they're willing and they're able, try to support them in finding the resource, the tools, uh, a managed server, a partnership, whatever, in order to get that done. You, the th one of the common themes up here is there's a lot of things to do. Not one person can do all these things. Not one tool can do all those things. And just on the things that we've mentioned, if you had one person dedicated to looking at all that stuff all day long, they still don't have enough time to do that. Plus whatever stuff you actually see on a day-to-day -day basis that you actually care about. So have the conversations. So at least you know where your blind spots are and you're not walking around unaware. Give our uh, panel a, a great big hand. Excellent, excellent comments, excellent uh, insights. Uh, one last thing is uh, Mainstream will offer a complimentary external uh, vulnerability assessment. Uh, we, we can scan the outside of your environment and uh, ask you just a handful of questions and kind of give you a, a high level uh, view of, of are you at least, are you, uh, how you look from the outside uh, so there's a link and a QR code. I believe there's some cards that have the information on them around too. Um, thank you all for, for coming today. Uh, there'll be a survey going out, so always appreciate your feedback. And it's, it's your feedback about these sessions that contribute to the content for the next session. So uh, thank you all again, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.